Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Quantitative Label-Free Imaging and its Many Applications, presented by Dr. Peter O'Toole, a director of the Bioscience Technology Facility, head of imaging cytometry in the Department of Biology at University of York, and Dr. Rakesh Suman, a biological application scientist at Phase Focus. I'm Dr. Susie Valdez of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen Type the questions into the drop-down box that appear on the screen, and our speakers will respond to your questions via email. If you have any trouble hearing or seeing this presentation, just click on the Ask a Question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credit tab that's located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Please join me now in welcoming our presenters, Dr. Peter O'Toole and Dr. Rakesh Suman. I will now turn the presentation over to them. Welcome, gentlemen. Susie, thank you very much for that introduction. It's very kind of you. Uh, so yes, I'm Peter O'Toole. Yeah, and I'm Rakesh Suman. Okay, so actually, uh, you can see it's a joint talk. Uh, Rakesh used to work for me properly uh, here at York before moving on to become an application specialist at Phase Focus. Uh, but actually, we're going to be talking about a lot of the work he actually started here uh, as a postdoc uh, in the early days. Uh, before I move off our first slide, actually, I'd just like to introduce my team uh, who aren't here to present with us, but are actually really important. Uh, the blue guys, so the people in blue here, uh, are my core staff. They, they work within the facility as a service provision, but I've been very instrumental in a lot of this developmental work, especially Joanne Marison, who was a pivotal, really at the very start, the inception of the work that we'll be talking about. And then in black, there's loads of the postdocs, including Rakesh, who actually is still a visiting scientist in my lab here at York uh, and part of that, that, that team. Um, I still see it very much as a team itself. So to give you some idea, I'd like to introduce a bit about us uh, to give you a, some context as to where we're going and, and why I'm interested in label-free microscopy. So I actually work uh, at the University of York uh, at the, in the Department of Biology, which is a multidisciplined department. It actually has a whole tranche of, of different biologists uh, here working for us. You know, we've got the infectious ones, they'd, they'd, they'd be the immunologists. I think you get it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've got the users and the, the people who come to use the microscopes that really bug us, they'd be the uh, uh, microbiologists. Right. Or were they the fun guys? Fun, I got fun guy. Yeah, the fun guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can see where this is branching out, but that would be with the plant biologists. Uh, and then the ones that are developing still, they'd be the cell de developmental biologists. You can see I've got a pun for all of these, but I know our time is limited. But the key thing is here, is the applications we look for are serving the vast array of different biological applications. We're not really focused just on cancer just on immunology, we're looking across the broad church of biological applications. Critically, the imaging lab is actually part of the bioscience technology facility, which I'm very grateful to actually now be director of. But I also have my own lab, which is the imaging and cytometry lab. Uh, there's also the genomics, the bioinformatics, protein production, molecular interactions, metabolomics and proteomics labs. But you'll notice actually my previous director made this, uh, I can't remember what you call it, This visual thing on the right. We can't call it a logo or anything. Uh, information icon type yeah. thing. But you'll notice he put imaging and cytometry at the top. And I, I thought that was uh, quite clever. I thought that he obviously likes me a lot. Or he's meaning something. And actually, I thought deeper. And I realized why imaging and cytometry is at the top. Because I would argue microscopy is one of the lead techniques out there. And this is why genomics. Uh, we have a great genomics facility. Genomics, as you know, for the last, oh, I don't know, 17, 18 years, we've known the human genome is an awesome and a really powerful tool. 
But ultimately, if you go even just look at the RNA that has been transcribed, it doesn't tell you ultimately that the protein has been transcribed. So at which point, even though the RNA is present, it doesn't mean the protein that's actually going to do anything that is functional is present. So genomics can only take us so far before it comes up against a brick wall and becomes a bit limited. But I've got my metabolomics and proteomics lab and they say, ha, Pete, don't worry. We can take your tissue, we can take your cells, obviously not my cells or Rakesh's own cells, but cells that we're working with, that would be inappropriate. And we can take those cells and we can find and identify what proteins have been transcribed, what proteins are physically in that cell, which is great. So now I know the protein has been transcribed, but it doesn't tell us if the protein is folded correctly. It doesn't tell us if it's localized to a functional unit. It doesn't tell us if the cofactors, the co-proteins, have come together to form a, a, a functional complex. So even proteomics runs up against a similar brick wall and becomes limited. But hey, as a biochemist, we have the molecular interactions lab. They can actually now, with a protein production lab, they can make lots of this protein and we can get it in our cuvette. And in that cuvette, we can do our biochemical analysis. We can look at our, I know, SPRs, we can do our fluorimetry, our circular dichroism, all different types of microcolorimetry. We can look at enthalpies associated with this. We can look at arm off rates. We can look at enzymatic activities. We can look at all that biochemical and biophysical information. But ultimately, it's in a cuvette, <laughs> which isn't really related to real life scenarios. It's a great tool, it's essential. But what we really need to do is see that protein inside the living cell. And that's what we can do in microscopy. We can now see the protein has been transcribed. We can see it's in the cell. We can see where it's localized to the cell. And then if we do our fret, flap, flip, flap, and flim, fret, flap, flip, flap, and flip, there's an awful lot of four letter F words associated with fluorescence microscopy. If you can think of any other four letter F words, maybe not, don't, 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 not now. But critically, not only can we see the proteins, we can do our fraps, our frets, we can look at our protein protein interactions, we can look at our dynamics, we can do our biochemical and biophysical studies of the protein inside the living cell, which is why microscopy is the best technique out there for any biologist. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm kind of half joking about this, uh, and I'll come to this slide right at the end, but, but only half joking. Obviously, the, the problem in microscopy is you're usually limited to the number of cells that you can look at, which is, don't forget, I am a cytometrist as well, which is why cytometry gives us those with statistical numbers and statistical relevance, which I think is really important itself. So the lab itself isn't just a, a core facility. We also do a lot of developmental research. Uh, we're an international hub for a large African project. Uh, we do a lot of beta testing for commercial companies. Uh, international reference sites for different bits of kit. But to, the one area I want to concentrate on today is tychography, label-free imaging. And that's, we've really been there at the inception of tychography for life cell science. Uh, gee, how many years ago? Probably Six. eight, probably eight, actually, eight. 2010, I think, we started to get involved with this. And this is for label-free imaging. Now, you might ask yourself, we can do this. What, what's so different about label-free imaging? Well, arguably, it's less invasive, which is, which is important, fewer, with fewer perturbations. Uh, and it's quantitative, which enables us to do live cell imaging. But we can do live cell imaging with fluorescent tags. We can label them and see them. But that may cause perturbations. Uh, so Rakesh and I are, are humans uh, with uncannily similar shirts by coincidence. Either that or he's copy, copying me. I'm not quite sure which. But we are both wearing shirts. Okay, We can eat and drink and walk and talk, but we are labelled because we are wearing clothes. Now, we can still eat and drink and walk and talk if we were unlabeled. Maybe don't think about that for too long. And if you are thinking about that, please be looking at Rakesh. <laughs> not me on this point. Okay, He's probably better than I am when he's labelled free. Maybe not, Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Regardless, our subtle behaviours would be different if we were label free. Now, when we look at live cells, when we do our fluorescence imaging of cells, and we, we watch them go through cell cycle and divide, we presume that the cells are happy because they can go on to grow and divide and proliferate. But it's those subtle behaviours that we may have perturbed that we will miss. We won't realise that. So if we can minimise the need to label, 
if we can remove it altogether, we get closer to the true life scenario. And that's why I, I feel that, like, that label free imaging is really important. So tychography is a form of quantitative phase imaging. And it can take your normal image, uh, as you can see here, and it can convert it into uh, a, a high contrast image, which looks very similar to a fluorescent image, but isn't fluorescent. It's a quantitative phase image from a label, a sample that has not been labeled with any stains whatsoever. And that's important. And this next movie shows something quite, quite important. If you look at the image you can see on the screen at the moment, you can see three concentric circles at the bottom right of this. So bot the very bottom one has been exposed three times to, different, uh, to, to, to UV light. I know UV is never ideal, but still plenty of people do Hertz and DAPI, uh, especially Hertz for live cell tracking uh, within there. Uh, there's better, you could go and use DRAC5, guys, if you're doing that. Go and use something out in the red. But nonetheless, it's still commonly used. And any light is going to potentially cause perturbation to the sample. So that bottom circle has been irradiated once. The second circle up, that area has been irradiated twice. And just off to slightly up and to the left, it's been irradiated three times. The rest of the images have not seen any fluorescent illumination itself. And so if we watch this movie, you'll see how the cells die after one, with the ones that have been exposed total of three times. And you'll see twice, they start to die and slow down. Third, they're a bit slower, but the population that hasn't been touched is completely undisturbed at that point. So if we just look at the video now. Okay, so hopefully you saw what we were talking about at, at that point. So how do we get this data to start with? I, I think that's a, always a good question with it. And this is how we get our quantitative phase image. Actually, Rakesh, come on, you're the expert at this. Okay, so we're, what we're generating here is a quantitative phase image. It's a way of getting that high contrast from a label-free image. There's lots of methods out there for quantitative phase imaging, but on the live site with the product from Facebook, we use a method called tychography. And what this essentially does is calculate the phase delay as light passes through the cell. So you can see in the bottom right in the cartoon, light wave B is becoming delayed compared to light wave A. And in a nutshell, the bigger the phase delay, the brighter the pixel value in the image. The lower the phase delay, the lower the pixel value in your image. What's important is that this phase delay is dependent on physical properties of the cell. Both the thickness and the refractive index can cause a phase delay. And therefore, we'll see as we go on through the, the seminar, we can use this phase delay to quantitate um, genuine metrics such as dry mass, optical volume, and thickness of the cell. Okay. <clears throat> so this is quite neat. If we look actually what happens through this, we pass a, a very low intensity red laser beam through the specimen. And on the right, you'll see we get a series of different diffracted light pattern images. So the camera is looking directly at the laser beam, which means the, the intensity of light has to be attenuated, has to be decreased to really low power. So this really is pretty much shining light that is negligible, especially out in the far red. Uh, and that's one of the great things about a lot of the quantitative phase imaging techniques that are out there that enables us to do this. Then once we've got those images, we can move it forward and we can take those tiled images, take it through the Fourier transform through the algorithm to give us our quantitative phase image, which is what you see over on the right of your screen at the moment. But that gives us quantitative information within there. Actually, go on, Rakesh, you are... Uh, Go on, just to contrast with me, you can talk about this one. <laughs> okay, so what we're looking at on this slide is um, how we can start to turn those images into metrics. So we'll do that by comparing what contrast we gain from a quantitative phase image compared to conventional label-free imaging technology. So we have the same sample here, the same line profile across the same three cells. And it's only when you start looking at the line profile, the gray values, 
you can see that it's only with the quantitative phase image that you see these three distinct peaks, one for each cell. To try and get that same information from the phase contrast, so the DIC image, is very difficult. You have the same amount of gray level in the DIC image as you do inside the cell, as you do in the background alone, and also in the phase contrast image, you have these halo artifacts which are equivalent to features within the cell. <clears throat> So it's quite interesting. Every time I show this image for the first time to new users or potential customers, they tell me, is that a fluorescence image? And there's good reason, because when we look at the same sample stained with fluorescence, we can see we have the same level of contrast as a fluorescence image. But we're generating this without the use of any labels or any high illumination power to excite those fluorophores, to excite those labels. Yes, very illuminating. <laughs> But the critical thing for me uh, is that my users uh, can do their life cell imaging now, but they can now actually segment their cells uh, and with ease. Because it's not easy otherwise. So we can take areas of high confluency and actually segment the cells themselves so we can do our quantitative analysis on such fields of view itself. And actually, we can then obviously not just take an image, we can repeat taking an image and then take another image and another image and another image. So we can do our time lapse for this. Uh, so in this case, actually, I think, actually, the, day, the previous data was mine. This is your data. So I'm going to, uh, York is actually home of many things, including uh, different confectionaries. So actually, I'm going to take a break while Rakesh talks you through this slide. OK, so what you're going to see next is um, you're going to see a video showing a scratching um, assay. And here we've segmented and tracked every single cell within the scratch. So uh, just enjoy this next video clip. Hopefully you got that. Uh, sorry, do you want to break as well? Oh, thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, what was really good, it's not just the ability to time lapse the image itself. It's also the ability to get quantitative information out of that. And that's a key difference, again, compared to DIC or phase contrast, is we can now get measurements that are unique to quantitative phase imaging processes. So, of course, we can look at cell count, we can look at area, perimeter, length, circularity, but we can now get granularity, we can look at the mass, the volume, the thickness, bits of information, quantitative phase information, that, that is completely novel to QPI techniques. And that's really enabling us, or we're going to show you just mind-blowing, that we can start to pick out new phenotypes that we didn't know existed before. But putting time to this and getting the kinetic data with big longitudinal studies, we can look at the speeds, the displacements, the velocities, how they interact with other cells in the underwing index. And what really struck us is that every cell tells a different story. And, and that's been a huge thing for me, certainly at York, is to look at that. <clears throat> and it's, as a flow cytometrist, you know, we look at single cell analysis. And from that single cell analysis, we quite often look at the population and we look at the medians and we look at this. But I can still go back to the individual and the parts of the flow cytometer. And now we have to think about our imaging in exactly the same way as we go through this. And actually, it was this movie that, that I will show you next that, that actually shows this in really good detail. So if I just uh, quickly play you this video, uh, and talk you through what's happening on this slide. So let's look at a whole big field of view uh, that we can look at. What we'll do now is zoom in to just an area using the red box to highlight what we're looking at. At the top left is a microglial cell. In the middle is a cell on a bit of debris that's going to get brighter and brighter and brighter because it's apoptotic. And just to the left of that is a dead cell. We're now going to see that bright cell pop lose the intensity in the cell at the top, and swoop down and eat that cell off that bit of debris. As soon as it's done that, it will notice a cell that was at nine o'clock and it's going to eat that in entirety to become a very large cell indeed. Ah, fat boy that's there. Now the yellow box is what we'll come to next. 
That was great. Let's show the next bit. Now, if we look at the yellow boxes, the cell just below the centre is about to divide into two. We now have two identical cells. The cell on the left gets the munchies. It's the hungry sister, and it will shoot off, starting to eat every bit of apoptotic material it can see. Sister on the right, just below the air bubble, is doing nothing. Sister on the left shoots off to the left again and goes through and eats even more debris just off screen. Comes back and there's a lot more to the north, so it shoots off to the north, eating even more. Now the cell below appears to have done nothing, but it has. It's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger, up until the point that it divides again itself. And then you have the same will happen again. How cool was that? that? That is just awesome. But that cell that went off, that, that, the, the, you had the two daughter cells, uh, let's call them sisters because they are sisters, uh, that were meant to be identical but obviously had asymmetric division, were very different in their behaviours. And the cell that got the munchies, we actually gave a, a name to. <clears throat> we, we give ourselves names because uh, it kind of helps us identify with them. And we call this cell Dyson. Now we called it Dyson for several reasons. Firstly, I appreciate that this is an international audience. We'll have people right around the world. I don't know what time it is, where you are at the moment, but uh, morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, can you need some coffee if it's the middle of the night? Hey ho. A coffee can be good. We call it Dyson though, because Dyson is an example of British engineering. Hey! Mm. See, we do do something useful every now and then. It's elegant and yet simple. Bit like our shirts, really. Uh, I'm elegant. He's doesn't matter. <laughs> <Shut and quiet. laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't think either of us are very quiet, so I'm not sure either. So that efficient, but efficient and quiet. Okay. And Dyson is, I would say, a well leader. So hey, Fred, so our contribution is, uh, yeah, vacuum cleaners. <laughs> However, for anyone watching this that's into your microscopes, I would like to point out to any microscopy manufacturer that there's more. Vacuum cleaners in the world, then there are microscopes. Hey, so go as Brits. See, we do do something useful every now and then. So this now is going to show Dyson. So if we just look at this still for a moment, you can see at the top of the image, uh, there's a cell coming down from about 12 o'clock, just to the left of 12 o'clock. Coming down, you can see the new right. There's lots of apoptotic material on that new right. Dyson's going to come in from the bottom right. So if I just play that video for you now, Now you're going to come in from the right, clean up the apoptotic material, and disappear off. If you look closely at the new right, if you've got the resolution on your monitors, you can see it clean it off the new right, take it up, and go down. And if you look at the very bottom, you'll see a new right that's about to divide. You'll see the chromosomes align and divide over time. It's pretty cool. So that was a, a really cool movie of uh, watching Dyson itself. And I, I would say, I've got to say, he was actually born in York here. So uh, I should actually, uh, we have chocolate named after him too. It's a Yorkie <laughs> bar. There you go. He gets hungry this time of the afternoon. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the key thing is watching one cell tells us very little. It's, it's fascinating. We wonder what's going on. But we need lots of cells to make this statistically relevant. And that's what's great now, because with the type of graphic method we have here, we can look at huge fields of view. I think this was three millimeters by three millimeters in this particular instance. And from that, we can then also take our individual time tracks for each cell and see how they all behave within that mass population. Just like flow cytometry, but with time and time lapse movies, you can actually watch the fate of the cells, which is when we came across the next cell that we call, which was called Usain Bolt. Now Usain Bolt, because he too, is a world leader. Now, I don't like to be beaten, and I'm about to race Usain Bolt. So we thought it would be a good idea here to actually uh, give him some drugs, doping, but not to speed him up, but critically to slow him down and all his cohorts within that population. Of course, being a true scientist, we will now compare that against a control sample that have had no drugs whatsoever. Do the race, what should happen? 
Usain Bolt still won the race. So as you see, we did lots and lots of time tracks, watched all the cells, and then we plotted their speed uh, against time. And we can see here, after 24 hours, yeah, they seem to be slowed a bit. So the magenta ones are the ones that have been treated with drugs. The control samples, the square boxes that are gray, are the controls. And you can see here that the treated cells in magenta have all been slowed down on average. But if you look at 48 hours, the fastest cell happens to be a magenta cell. After 72 hours, the fastest cell, by some way, is Usain Bolt, that magenta cell. And this is really important. Is it just an outlier? There shouldn't be outliers. This is a cell that is behaving differently. And you've got to think, well, why is it behaving differently to the rest of the population? If this was a chemotherapy drug, you know, this drug's working really well. It's affecting 99% of the cells, but 1% of the cell, it doesn't react with it or it behaves opposite to what you wanted to do. So it's that 1% that ends up killing us, not the 99% that are affected. So this outlier is actually really, really important. And I think I've just called you insane Bolton murderer at the same time. <laughs> so if it doesn't get for done for drugs, we'll have him on something else as well. So why was that cell different? Well, I can see now that it's different. Okay, so I've got that in my single dot plots for flow cytometry type analysis. But critically, I can now add new metrics to it. I can see if he was a bigger or slower cell, and that's important, a bigger cell. I can see if he was skinnier or if he was rounder. Okay, I can get an idea of the structure of the cell. You know, was he a star-shaped cell? Why so many cells star-shaped? Never wondered that. Okay, we can see because we can look at the mass of the cell. It relates relates uh, to the intensity. We can see if he packs more proteins. He got more protein packed in, or was he, or was he more diffuse compared to others? We can get all these unique phase metrics, which can help us understand. Given that we can phenotype, give him a different phenotype compared to the other cells, and so we can put all those metrics we're looking to to each an individual single cell. Look at another population, we go back to the single cell. But my bread and butter is fluorescence microscopy. And as good as quantitative phase imaging is, we still sometimes need to see more. Actually, sometimes we need to see uh, a lot more uh, from it. And fluorescence gives us that. Because what I can't tell you is how much of any specific protein is within that cell or cell population itself. And that's really important. But of course, this is a microscope. So we've got it on the QPI system. Critically, we can now correlate these with fluorescence microscope images. So we can take our quantitative phase image and we can then overlay it in situ with the fluorescence image. This is actually uh, work that Rakesh was working on in the lab when he was working with us here and trying to identify microglia from astrocytes to neurons. And we could do our assay. And then at the end of our time lapse, our label free image, we could stop the experiment and do our endpoint assay, adding the fluorescence molecules to it. So we can do that as an endpoint. But actually, that's not always what you want to do. Sometimes you need fluorescence at the same time, and we'll look at that later. So Rikesh, this is what it looks like now, which is a lot better than the Heath Robinson setup we had <laughs> some, some eight years ago or more. So, yeah, it's coming a long way as, as the, the, the live site system. And I won't bore you with all the hardware because this is an educational uh, seminar at the end or an educational lecture at the end. So this is just a, a picture of the live site instrument. You can learn a lot more about this by going to the Phase Focus website where you learn a lot of information. Just, just plug this website, my <laughs> right, you me. But what I do want to talk to you about is what we can do with the images. Uh, we've got that high contrast image that Peter's talked about but I want to show you next how you can take that high contrast image, perform that segmentation, the tracking, and turn it into metrics. Because at the end, what we want to do, we need the numbers to describe what's happening in those videos. We want that beautiful nature paper, and we need to quantify. We can't just put in a video anymore and say, this looks great, cells are moving. We need to be able to quantify. So in the next few slides, I'll show you some of the applications and how we can quantify. So here we have um, an example of a um, a handful of applications for the live site. Um, it's not exhaustive, but I'll start here with the cell death and proliferation assay. So let's focus on an individual cell to start with. Um, what we can do, we can track that cell throughout the time uh, lapse. We can watch the cell divide. We can then track a daughter cell up until the next division event. And we can see what's happening to that cell. We can quantify in the top graph here is the mean thickness. So we see at the point of mitosis, the cell becomes very round and very thick. 
at the point of mitosis. Then the daughter cells divide, uh, the, the cell divides, and have two daughter cells, which have a, a very low thickness throughout the cell cycle. So is that, that just looking at that, that's just over two and a half and coming up to around five? In... Yes, so, so what okay. we're seeing here is a dry mass of the cell. So what we see at the start of the cell cycle to the end of the cell cycle, we have a doubling of the dry mass of the cell. Until then, we reach the next point, which is mitosis again. And what you can see as well, if you do zoom into your cells, you can start to identify the individual stages of mitosis. So we can look at the, the chromosome alignment on the mitotic spindle for metaphase. So we can even look a little bit de in more detail at the specific stages of um, mitosis. I, I, I love what you've done with the trace. That looks, I just think that looks so brilliant. I wanted it to I, match I, your shirt. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> My slide looks so rubbish before I gave it to me. <laughs> so much better at it than I am sometimes. Excellent. So working uh, working with that, so we've seen that phenotype. We've seen when a cell is undergoing mitosis, we have this huge increase in the cell thickness. And this is actually one of Peter's early publications before I started. So I'll actually hand over back to you yes, uh, to so describe there, this. There was a time before Rakesh, uh, <laughs> so, so with tychography as well. So actually, as a flow cytometrist, uh, one of the things we thought in the very early days, we could look at apoptosis and we could look at cell cycle. Uh, without staining, which we thought, because we know we see a mass change, volume change, refractive index change, which is really critical to this. And so we can see just in the two images here that we can then segment the cells, put them into a dot plot, and we can then easily see, just by looking at the thickness versus area, we can identify our mitotic cells, just as I'd want to on a flow cytometer, and then trace back to those individual cells, which is essentially what this is, this is really crude stuff. This was Heath Robinson stuff with bubble wrap as an incubator. <laughs> That's how, how cool it was. But I, I just love dot plots. To be fair, I, I, I just love dots. Don't yeah. stop, but then another York confectionery at the same time. And do you want to join a Smarty? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like Smarties, but then I, I would class him as a Smarty as well. Thank Go you. on. Go on, take over. Okay, so with this dot plot, what we can then do is we can gate out that phenotype. So we can start to look at the dividing population uh, the mitotic cells against a non-dividing population. But we, what we want to do is actually run an assay. We want to look at proliferation and cell death over a, a well plate. So in this example here, we have A509 cells. We've treated them with an increase in concentration of cell sporin, and we can see what happens to the mass of the cells. <coughs> so we're going to focus on the two extremes, the untreated and the 10 micromolar cell sporin. And what we can do is we can quantify the dry mass of all the cells at each time point. And by doing this, we can then plot a rate of proliferation by uh, the increase in dry mass over time. So we can see that on the top line of the graph that the dry mass is increasing in the untreated sample. However, with 10 micromolar cell sporine, what we have is a sudden drop of dry mass as those cells burst in the, in the apoptotic phase. What we then see is a loss of the dry mass, uh, loss, loss of the intracellular constituents. So that's great. We can report the dry mass and we can use that to tell us if the cells are proliferating or if they're dying or if they become static. So I want to move on to uh, our next application um, that I have here. And this is a gap closure assay, or sometimes called a scrattering assay. <laughs> and cause it to get there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is play you the, the next video. And this is an example of a, a scratch rune assay. Again, we take the multi well plate approach and we're looking at a control and for um, five other treatments. So I'll go ahead and play this movie and you can see how the wounds close. Excellent. So if you focus in on that movie, you would be able to see that different um, um, treatments were affecting the wound closure. And what I want to show you here is a metrics that we can generate from that video. So we see at the start and then we go to the end of the time lapse. We can see that uh, the treatment compound in green, we can see that is inhibiting the rate of wound closure. So we want to report that. So we can look at population-based metrics. We can tell you the start and end area of that wound. We can also track the wound area over time. And by plotting this, we can calculate two values. We can tell you the half-life 
of uh, wound closure. So the time taken for the wound to close by 50%. We can also report the collective migration. So how fast was that leading edge moving? So you can see already that treatment C2 is causing an inhibition <coughs> of both uh, the wound closure reported by an increase in the half-life, but also a decrease in the collective migration. But for those of you who have got eagle eyes, you probably saw that the cells have been segmented on the leading edge. So the leading edge cells are segmented in red. So we can move away from the population-based metrics for wound closure assays, and we can directly start to report wound closure at a single cell level. So what we're showing in this graph here is an instantaneous velocity of those leading edge cells in response to the treatments. So we can see again, treatment C2 compared to control is causing, it has a decrease in their speed. We can see treatments B1 and B2 compared to control have an increase in their speed. But there's more to migration than just the speed. We want to know the directionality. So they're not just Christmas decorations? No, they're not. Uh, it's too early. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like a Christmas decoration. <laughs> Love the data. Okay. So we want to look at another way, uh, another part of uh, motility. We want to look at the directionality. And whilst treatments B1 and B2 look quite similar in their cell speed, it's only when we report the directionality that we can see the differences. We can see now that treatment B1 causes more of the cells to move in a perpendicular fashion. Uh, with respect to the leading edge compared to B2. And to complete the story, the treatment C2, which had an, inhib an inhibitory effect on wound closure, had a reduction in the cell speed. We can see that reflected in the migration. There's no overall directionality to the cells. So as you can see, we get a lot of information, so really advancing that wound healing assay. So I want to move on next to what we call a label-free dynamic uh, phenotype. So what do I mean by this? So let's take this example. We have metastatic breast cancer cells. And on the left in blue, we have them untreated. On the right, we have hit them hard with a 10 micromolar style sporine. And in the middle, we have a tonic stimulation, one nanomolar style sporine. So we can do our proliferation type of acid. We can look at the dry mass over time. So on the bottom left, we can see that 10 micromolar style sporine causes that reduction in dry mass as expected as the cells are dying. But there's no change between the control and the one nanomolar style sporine when we look at this population level. I've done a PhD and I'm always therefore paranoid about all the data that I generate. So I always take it to an independent machine. So we took this to the buy cell cell counter, which is a part of Peter's facility here, yeah. if you need to use it. Um, so um, we did the fixed time points on that buy cell and we saw the same effect. We saw that at the population level, there's no difference between control and one nanomolar style sporine. But remember, we had this, we've done this in time lapse and we watched these cells over time. So what we're looking at here now is a top-down view of the traces left from those cells over a 72-hour time lapse. And now it's clearly apparent that something is happening. In the control sample on the top, we can see the cells staying quite close to the point of origin. However, one nanomolar style sporine, what's not toxic, is changing their behavior we can see that the cells are moving further away and more sporadically. But that's not all. We need to now quantify this. This is great. We're onto something here. We need to put this data into numbers. So again, we can run this through the analysis packages, and then we can start to report this. So the first one we have here is distance from origin plots, and we can see that behavior, uh, a nice compact um, cell tracks in the control and very spread cell tracks in the one nanomole style sporing. We can take that flow cytometry analysis, which is actually quite useful to quantify behaviors. And what we're plotting here is a cell speed against the Euclidean distance. And you can see the yellow dots move further and further away from the, um, in this dot plot. So that's showing that one nanomolar style sporine is not only making the cells move faster, but they're also moving further away from the point of origin. And finally, we have a look at some morphological metrics. We can see on the x-axis here, we have sphericity, and on the y-axis, we have the meandering index. So again, the yellow dots are showing us that the cells actually have a change in phenotype. They're becoming less spherical, and they're moving in a more direct fashion. So it's cool, because they just want to be picked up with an endpoint assay, or just looking at cell division, because they look like they're proliferating at the same rate. But the subtle things, by putting time as a dynamic dimension and having the population to look at, We've learned so much more about these populations. To so our researchers here, and they're really moving and exploiting this, 
to look at the subtle characteristic differences and why they're characteristically different between different cells. Sorry, anyway, sorry, go on. Yeah, so um, just to summarise on this slide, you would have missed that information on a standard um, DOSH response curve. So uh, in a standard DOSH response, we would look at the maximum um, uh, effect of the drug, the IC50, EC50, but at the bottom of the tail of that DOSH response curve, there is actually things happening. This would have been 10, and uh, one nanomole status point does nothing to these cells. Okay, so we'll move on to our next and uh, final application that we'll discuss today. Peter mentioned earlier on in the seminar that we still want fluorescence um, with our data. We still need to look at these behaviours, but we still want the molecular specificity. What's causing these cells to move faster, change their shape? So we need that correlative fluorescence capability. So on the live site, we can run a phase and fluorescence image, and we can have full spatial temporal correlation of that throughout a time that study. But what we want to do as well is during a time lapse, we still might want to use we still might want to use the, the presence imaging, but we don't want to image at the same interval. So we don't want to image with presence every 20 minutes. Because then we're back to the same problem again. We're introducing labels, we're introducing that toxic dose. So in this next video here, what you'll see is on the top part, we'll see the quantitative phase image, which was acquired every 20 minutes. And the bottom part of the, the video, you'll see the correlative presence and phase image. So the presence was acquired every one hour to minimize that uh, presence uh, toxicity. So I'll just go ahead and play this video. Excellent. So we saw in that video, we can still perform long-term time-lapse imaging with fluorescence whilst minimizing um, the, the toxic dose of the fluorescence. So I'll very quickly run through. So there was an asset, there was a reason behind running that time-lapse video. So in this experiment here, we wanted to go from genotype to phenotype. Um, so on the right, um, we have cells that are expressing the gene, uh, so high. Uh, in the middle, we have low expression of the gene. And on the left, we have a co-culture above the high and low. And we want to look at the phenotype. What does this gene do um, to our cells? We can look at proliferation, and we can see that the presence of this gene reduces the rate of proliferation. We can then go on to look at the morphology. So again, genotype to phenotype, look at the morphological phenotype. We can see that the presence of this gene will increase the area of the cell, reduce the sphericity, and reduce the length to width ratio. So we are seeing a morphological phenotype associated with this gene. And then we look at the, the tracking. So we was able to track these cells over time. And we can then tell you that the presence of this gene slows the cells down as well. So we have truly that genotype to phenotype. But the true question in this experiment was, what happens when we mix these cells back together? Do they communicate? Do they lose their phenotypes, their uniqueness? And just like to point out, this data uh, was courtesy of Rob Judson from UCSF. Uh, we did a nice collaboration here using uh, the instrument for his data. So very quickly, to our final question, uh, we had them cultured in isolation, but on the left, we have put them together. Uh, we have the fluorescence metric, so we can gate out the, the expressing cells uh, against the non-expressing cells. And then we can analyze those independently within that cold culture. So really exploring the heterogeneity and based on the fluorescence reader. And in summary, what we see, even in the cold culture, we still have a reduced rate of proliferation for the high expressing cells. Um, and also we still maintain the change in the morphological and the behavioral phenotype. So that brings me to the end of, of my section um, of, the, of the seminar. And I'll hand it back to Peter. I've got to say, that was a lovely bunch of segments that you just talked through, Rakesh. And actually, York is also famous for, again, inventing yeah. things. Um, you know, when it comes to these chocolate oranges, York is also famous for where it was invented here at York. So uh, 
Here's for your segments, and yes, I'd love one, please, when you've got it ready. Uh, so actually, I'm going to just very, very quickly now, just whirlwind through, because I'm not the scientist that did this work, but I'll talk you through a case study that we've done here at York itself. And this was actually on prostate cancer research. Critically, this was done in a professional maintenance group, and it's actually Fiona and Amanda that put a huge amount of effort into here. Uh, they trusted this technology from the, from the early days, but a great deal of faith in it, and they've been rewarded for that. And they, they've done some really remarkable work. And actually, I'm only gonna show you one bit, which I think really highlights and the importance of understanding and getting these metrics out of the cells. They're really, what they're really good at is using human patient cells, primary prostate cancer cells. You don't wanna think about <laughs> how, how they get them. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, compared to using normal cell lines themselves, Obviously, normal cell, you know, immortalized cell lines are great. We can do loads of research and they're vital for it. But primary cells can behave differently. And actually, the QPI has been really good at revealing the differences in their behaviors. And this is just it. You know, if we look at back, back this is research that we, they did last year on some of the primary cells. If we look at the time tracks down at the bottom two panes, it's really good to actually look at the tracks. They behave remarkably different over the same time frame compared to the other. Uh, cell line populations that you can see here. It's remarkably different. Uh, and that just shows you how critical it is that even just using cell lines can have an effect, but using primary cells is great. But if we were then to go and label those primary cells, there's a good chance we'll perturb them further. We've already extracted them, so, you know, we're not perfect. So uh, he's not <laughs> perfect. But at least we can minimize those perturbations. And that shows just what difference that can make you can primary cells. But why were those primary cells different? Why were they moving differently? And certainly we can look at the area of the cells and you can see the primary cells are, are significantly larger in cell area compared to the immortalized cells. And we can look at their kinetic features and they're maybe a bit more varied, but yeah, it's slightly faster than the other ones. But the mass of the cells was actually less over time so actually they weren't proliferating to the same uh, degree compared to others. It's quite a remarkable set of stats and putting all that together to give us a unique phenotype of those primary cells over other cells. And maybe we can use those other cells if we find the cells that have the same phenotype of behaviors. We don't know where all this is going. And so what they've also been able to do is watch their untreated cells and then use on the primary cells, throw drug treatments at them, see how those primary cells react. And we haven't had to have fluorescence to track the cells over time, see how they've changed. We haven't had to use fluorescence, see which ones are differentiated, because they differentiate, we see different populations pop up just for the unique quantitative phase measurements. So we can look at their velocities, how far they meander, the roundness of them, and the amount that we've been eating through this, I think we've probably been getting round. <laughs> By the way, I still haven't got my segments. Cheers, <laughs> Rickett. Yeah, I do want a segment of chocolate orange. Uh, so you can see even we're getting around. But we can see that they are unique in their differences. And then when we look at that as a whole population, when we have a bimodal population, so we have two discrete ones, you can see when they're treated, they actually split differently to untreated, and we have two different responders within that population because primary cells will behave differently because they're not just one cell population, they differentiate, we get changes. But now we can watch it and we can time track it, we get all that quantitative information for both populations that have responded positively or negatively to those drugs. So this is work that uh, Fiona and Amanda in Normal Maintenance Group are undergoing at the moment. It, it's, it's just fantastic work. So finally, before I leave you, I just want to give you uh, one thought. I asked you at the start why microscopy is the most important technique out there to all of us today. And I half-jokingly said about genomics being kind of hitting the wall, proteomics doing similar biochemistry, even if it's a biochemistry it hurts, that maybe had its limitations. And that's why microscopy was ultimately the best technique out there. I'd like to now turn that on its head. Actually, I think microscopy is only the starting point. You know, now I know that I have these subpopulations. Now I know these all these phenotypic differences within the cells. I now want to go and look at those individual cells and look at my genomic data, my transcript. What is transcromically dip Dyson and its sister? I haven't got a name for Dyson's sister. What was the difference between the two? And you know, this is needle in the haystack job. If I had those two cells and could look at those on a single cell basis, I could remove the haystack, leaving me just the needles that made them 
difference and behave differently. So I want to now link microscopy. This is where it's all going. Single cell imaging to single cell transcriptomics, single cell metabolomics and further. Not only that, something actually we're getting here at York uh, in the coming months, uh, something called a nanostring digital spatial profiling system, uh, DSP, which enables us to do really high multiplex work. Easily 30 colors. Uh, so we can now look at 30 different proteins or 30 different transcription uh, transcription factors at the same time, potentially up to 1,000 different markers on the tissue at the same time in one sweep. So what we can now hopefully do is move all of these microscopy techniques that you're going to be hearing about. It's not just us. You've got some other great talks from other speakers looking at phase imaging. Take those images. Let's start coupling those to other technologies that are out there today because actually microscopy is at the forefront of the next revolution of transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics. It will get there once we get the sensitivity. And I, I, I'd just like to say two things. Firstly, I'd like to say cheers to all of you listening and putting up with our rather mad talk. Uh, we, this is what life is like in the lab. It's kind yeah. of, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah it is. Okay. Also, it's all my lab because it's not just Rakesh and myself who've done this work. Actually, there's people here who are doing far more than I've done. <laughs> Uh, towards this work and all the team somehow to a greater or lesser extent are involved they all support that work and the groups that have helped provide this data and of course the importance of all the sponsors that have uh, actually provided information for this and actually if i'm looking at my watch right now somewhere in the world it must be uh after it's another york it's chocolate. chocolate yeah it is <laughs> so it must be after eight uh so we catch after eight okay so uh hopefully you've enjoyed it uh not got too big and uh thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tool and Dr. Susan for that informative presentation and your wonderful research. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window type your questions into the box that appear on the screen and click that send button. Our speakers will follow up with questions via email. So let's take a look at some of our viewers' questions now. Doctors, how do you keep cells in focus over such a long period? Ooh, that's a good question. That's something we missed completely, isn't it, I think? Uh, so the night, shall I answer this? Um, I can answer this one. You sure? Yeah. Okay, I'll answer it if he doesn't answer it well. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, so when you saw the, the slide on how we acquire the data, you probably noticed that we're not collecting an image. What we're collecting is a diffraction pattern. So we know how the light has scattered um, and what the sample has caused the light is scattering that way. We can then, with that information, we have the wavefront of how the lights behave to that diffraction pattern. So in the Fourier domain, we can move that wavefront back and forward so we can refocus the image post acquisition. So that uh, um, uh, is quite an alarming statement sometimes, but after you've acquired the image, we have the data to refocus that image. So in fact, there's never a frame out of focus. Your, uh, your microscope, your objective can drift over time, but we are always regaining that focus post acquisition. Yeah, so I think the key thing there is we're not dead stacking. There's no, we're not moving the dead stage to do it. We take the the, the, the one image, and it's the virtual focusing afterwards. The algorithm moves in space to refocus that data, which is mind blowing. Because as, as the question rightly points out, if you're time lapsing for five, six, seven days, I think the most we've gone to is seven days as a prolonged time lapse. Uh, 14. I, 14 is the most recent one. Okay, so we've now been gazumped. <laughs> someone's done two weeks. I, I love the fact someone's got enough time to do two weeks of one experiment. I just think they've got too much time on their hands. Uh, over Christmas, we won't get the three weeks. Uh, <laughs> but critically, it does drift in many other platforms uh, for fluorescence microscopy and stuff. So with the QPI, at least we can do that over time without it drifting. And that's been a big advantage. Dyson, that movie at the start, when you saw Dyson, that was just a clip out of a five-day time lapse itself. So great question. Thank you very much. Our next question is, what resolution can you achieve? Hmm. Uh, that, that, I, 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 that's a spin on each. That depends on the lens. It depends on the numerical aperture of the lens that we're using. 
the movies that you've seen through this and all the images have generally been with a very low NA 10 times or 20 times lens. Uh, so they're actually quite low resolution images, but they don't appear it. Uh, I think the resolution limit is probably up around the 250, 300, probably around 300 nanometers in theory. Uh, if you want to go better resolution using QPI, there's, there's more talks actually part of this uh, conference. Uh, I think there's one by Paul Park, Tomacube. Uh, I'll give a quick plug there because we're actually also working with the Tomacube system here at York. Uh, and that does get down to uh, quoted around 110, 120 nanometers quoted resolution on that. So that really helps the resolution and brings it down. But that's not what we're after here. We're really after whole cell information and huge fields of view and longitudinal studies. Uh, a lot of the, the other QPI systems out there are great if we zoom into one cell. And sometimes this is why we've got the other system uh, for getting that really fast temporal and spatial resolution information out of it. So the two type of techniques are really complementary. You'll hear more of that from some of the other speakers uh, throughout this uh, series. Thank you for that. And Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Suman, how many different samples in our experiment, in one experiment can be untake, undertaken? Oh, okay. So actually, I think Rakesh, you could probably comment. You alluded to doing multi-wells earlier. Yeah. So you can do up to 96 well platforms. Yes. Yeah, so so um, you can do you know, a series of, go on, go on. Yeah, so um, we can, um, on um, the, the unique way we acquire the data uh, with tachography, uh, we can um, resolve that meniscus problem. So we can now image a 96 well plate. And we've had users set up three independent experiments within a 96 well plate. So you can just use that space, the, the wells in there, to set up many different samples all at the same time. No, but big things to be cautious of uh, with that question that you're asking. You know, if you want to image really, really frequently, then you're going to do fewer wells. Uh, from my perspective, a lot of experiments that we're doing here are in between six and 24 wells. Uh, because they want that sort of, actually to get more information is beyond what the experiment needs. Uh, so actually, usually we can do 24 and get three replicates within that 24 wells that we do. So that's what most of our users are, are, are pushing up to. Some do 96, but very few because they're, they're just not looking at drug, drug dose comparisons in the same way to get fine detail, but good to hear it's possible. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Would you like to provide our viewers with any closing remarks? Uh, simply, if you've got more questions, pop us an email later. Rakesh will answer them. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening. Uh, yeah. Hopefully it's given you ideas of what you can do with your microscopy in the future and where this fits into the bigger picture. Uh, please listen to the other presentations as well. There's going to be some great talks I've seen lined up. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you for your lunch or your breakfast or your evening meal, whichever it is. Um, and uh, cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Atul, Dr. Suman, thank you again for your presentation and your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand through December 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.